Programming Throwdown, episode 134, Ephemeral Environments for Developers with Benji. Take it away, Patrick. Hey, everyone. We're here with Benji, the co-founder and CEO of Shipyard. His expertise, let's say, is something a little bit further away from mine than normal. So I'm kind of excited about this. Always a great opportunity to learn something new in the, the field of software and engineering. It's a big field. And I think the stuff we're going to talk about today is something that, you know, for me, at least, I studied, you know, programming in college, you had a CS degree. And when I was there, you very get in a very skewed view of how software development works. You're like one person or two people team, you think you got it figured out. And then you show up in your first job, and there's, you know, dozens of people on the team, and everything you thought you knew about how the world worked is just wrong. And so I think a little bit today, We're going to understand how in the real world, some of the complexities of building software happen and as well as even past that. And so happy to have Benji here. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, So let's start off. At least I traditionally like to start off by saying what was your sort of first experience with getting into development or programming or tech in general? Do you have like a formative moment? If not, I mean, that's okay too. Yeah, I think my formative moment was when my dad did something, I can't remember what it was, to my Commodore 64 so that I couldn't play the archery oh, no. game. And I somehow figured, I can't remember what it was, but I just remember I figured out how to get around something by typing a bunch of stuff. And there was definitely no Google in the day. So I was very proud of that accomplishment. And basically I caught the bug at a very, young, very, very young age of being like, oh, wow, like everybody's equal in the digital world. You just have to figure out the best. And so I would say that's when I really started. And then it probably took off a little bit more. And I will say that I am officially, I'm not a millennial. I'm not a, what's the other one? Yeah, I am. I'm an Oregon Trails generation. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that term, but I think it was Oh like, my yes. gosh, the game's amazing. Yeah. So if you know the game of Oregon Trails- yeah, exactly. If you are worried about dysentery and you're hunting squirrels, then you are in this in-between generational thing. Now, did you play the Apple one or the one on Windows where you could click to shoot the to shoot the squirrels? So I played, so in my day, I, I did play a little bit of the really early Apple one, but that was because my mom was an art teacher and she got us a free old Apple IIc like 10 years after they got them out of the classrooms. I don't know. Someone was like throwing them out and they I was a computer <laughs> nice. kid. But in school, I played the, there was like an early Macintosh one. So I think technically I was playing Oregon Trails 2. Uh, very on topic for this podcast, by the way. So oh, yeah, but this, this could, is so pertinent. Um, I'm glad that we could go through that. You got to have a shared history with people. It's all right. Yeah. It's right. good. It's good. Yeah. And then so. How did you kind of end up? I mean, now now this is your, you know, kind of your career and your entire, I mean, did you go to school to study engineering or, or programming sure. or, or what did your, what did your kind of path take? Yeah. So I actually ended up going to uh, UC Irvine computer science school and I studied computer science there and I did not realize it at the time, but I had a spectacular education and I really learned a lot. And one of the things I'd highlight, because obviously I've worked in this field for some time and I have a lot of some of the, probably my smartest friends are ones that have not gone to school. There's probably some exceptions to that, but, or the most effective engineers that I know at the very least. But I will say that for me going to school, it gave me some foundational stuff that I use every single day in every single conversation around, you know, technical decisions and just understanding, you know, how CPUs work at the very bottom there with assembly language and just all the different trade-offs. I I think I learned all of that from computer science school and I do hate assembly. Don't get me wrong. I really hate (laughs) Lisp. I really hate Lisp, but I had to... Oh, oh, don't talk about Lisp. Lisp is the way to get lots of feedback on the show. (laughs) Is that... I have have to tell you, I haven't listened to the back catalog but i know i know some airline company wrote their reservation system in for in lisp in 1990 and that's why everyone says lisp is a real language it is a real language sorry i don't think it's not a real language but i just hate all right just to be clear veggie's talking and not jason or I, so please send all the mail <laughs> yeah, no, to him this is, yeah i am the one saying no i'm not saying it's not i my issue is is that recursion makes my brain physically hurt and parentheses also make my brain hurt 
So I just Ooh, have a double whammy to it. Yeah. It's you know, like, I feel like I, I agree with that. One of the things that's interesting is Excel is so easy, which is all about recursion and, and functional point. programming. But I think, you know, point. I was thinking about this the other day. This is just, I guess, very serendipitous, but <clears throat> I was just thinking about and talking with some friends about why is Excel so easy when functional languages are so hard? And one thing that someone pointed out, which I thought was really interesting, is you know, with Excel, you see all the intermediate results. Like usually people don't write giant functions. They'll have small functions that'll output to cells, and then those cells will go into other cells. And so it's sort of like you're at any point in time, you're like tracing through your program just all the time. And that and and then we think that might be why Excel is is the only like program to really get functional languages to the masses. That's a good point. Uh, you know what else you just made me think about also is it's also a GUI. Like there isn't a GUI for Lisp. Or I, not when I was, I was actually schema, I think. Yeah, right. Was, but there's no, like you have that immediate feedback with the, with the cells. So there's kind of a GUI for functional in that regard, if that makes sense. I actually wrote my first neural net in Excel and I actually am really good at Excel. So you, it's ironic that you bring this up because <laughs> I love Excel um, or uh, Google Sheets, whatever. Yep, yep. So how did you get from neural networks in Excel to uh, Shipyard? We'll use that as a segue. Oh, that, yeah, that makes sense. Well, that was the that was back in the day, my computer science days. A call out to my professor, Dr. Frost. That was actually his oh. name. I love, I love calling him out. He's a great professor. So yeah, that was my 102 AI class I took a long time ago. But what ended up happening was I, I, I graduated school and I actually did a startup in Los Angeles. This is back in the day when it was just like MySpace, AOL, and, and my company. And it was actually a language translation company that was using uh, very early neural net stuff. This is a long time ago. It was it did not work very well. It kind of worked, but it didn't work all the way for language translation. But the, the takeaway there was that to your point, I showed up, I had a startup. How do I host this stuff? How do we do all these things? So I kind of, that started my DevOps journey, let's say. And back then it was like writing bash scripts for Linode, I believe. I think EC2 wasn't even out, I want to say, but maybe it was just beginning. S3 was around. I remember I used S3 back then. And then ended up moving out to New York and doing a bunch of other tech startup stuff. I co-founded one or two things. I'm also like VP of engineering. And throughout that entire career, I was always owning the DevOps responsibilities for my various companies that I was, was working. That encompassed everything from Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt. I mean, then later on, <clears throat> Dot Cloud, Docker, it became Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, the list goes on and on so and on. So like, actually, one question there is what made you go the startup route and not go into big tech like Microsoft or one of these companies? Like, like what, what was your thought process there? I mean, when I was in my day or in our day, maybe, you know, I was, you know, I was, Microsoft was the bad guy back in the day, which is crazy to me because Microsoft's the good guy now, which just, it just blows my mind when I think about. Windows or maybe there 10. are worse guys, you know, <laughs> it, maybe it's no, but I mean, but Microsoft has Ubuntu built into it. You turn on Windows 10 now and like Ubuntu, you just click on a button and you're in Ubuntu. And yeah, it's that, like, that's Whoa. very true. Very, very and that true. to me, I, I learned that like I haven't used Windows in I don't know ten years, fifteen years, something like that. But I learned I was on a friend's computer, and I was trying to help them with some Docker stuff. And I was like, "Can you just like download a virtual machine and give me like Linux or something?" And he's like, "Oh, I have it." I was like, "Oh, oh, you did?" That? He's like, "No, no, it comes with Windows." I was like, "What?" And so ever since then, I've been like, "Holy moly, everything's changed. It's." great but, but yeah sorry what was the question oh uh, yeah the question was like okay maybe you know look at the ecosystem of big companies you have microsoft mm. you have you have google you have yeah. uh, apple you have and so and you chose to like forego you know the the giant corporations and and go start you know start something like start a startup or go into the startup ecosystem and so i was wondering what made you go that route uh, you know i think that i just kind of have the the a little bit of I don't like cushy things. I like being challenged. I like kind of like clawing and scraping. I also, you know, Microsoft didn't recruit me. So maybe if they did, I would have. I don't know. I don't think I would have, to be honest with you. I really did not like Microsoft when I graduated school. Sorry to everybody. But I like them now. There are probably a few big, large tech companies that I probably shouldn't name that I would never work for these days. But Microsoft's not one of them, actually. And they're great in the space that we're in, in the CNCF cloud native world. 
Microsoft's been awesome lately. I, I can't believe I'm doing a Microsoft commercial all of a sudden somehow. But <laughs> anyway, but yeah, no, I think for me personally, I I like having I like having the opportunity to contribute across the board. And I think that the more of a corporate career path that you take, the less opportunity you have for being creative and, and finding things that, that you are more excited by. There's more risk and there's and there's you know, there's less financial stability, that's for sure. But that's never been a big issue to me. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, one thing I noticed, uh, so Patrick, actually, Patrick, have you ever, well, we'll, we'll jump to you later, but I, I've, this is my first time working for a company that isn't at least like, I don't know, 50,000 people or something, right? And so, and so one thing I noticed about, about uh, the startup I'm working at now is that, is that everyone in the company is working on the same thing. You know, I mean, even if you're, if you're in legal or finance or whatever it is, you know, everyone at the end of the day is trying to get one product out the door. And that I think is really something I didn't expect that I really enjoy. I just enjoy the fact that everyone I talk to is working on this thing. And it's not, oh, this person is trying to make like a hot air balloon with internet. And this other person is trying to do <laughs> an advertising, you know, you know, marketplace. And, and, and so legal is just like, you know, trying to, you know, satisfy all these different people. And at any given time, only one of them really, really matters to, to all these cross-functional teams. And so all of that kind of disappears when you're at a more focused company. Yeah, I've only ever worked at a massive corporation. So this is an experience that I, I have not yet, not yet have. That is a, that's a great observation. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that when you all are kind of struggling on the same topic, that cool things happen. And so I've, I've really enjoyed that throughout the course of my career. That being said, I never wanted to do a venture back company ever again. And myself and my co-founder, Peter, we kind of became these high priced Kubernetes DevOps engineers in the New York, mostly in the New York ecosystem, also some LA companies and San Francisco companies. And basically, to kind of skip a little bit forward to answer your actual question, we were basically going around helping companies in their transition from either traditional, you know, bare metal or some level of VM to to getting onto the container train, specifically around the Kubernetes um, and the production stuff. And basically, uh, a lot of we saw we started seeing a lot of patterns, and we kept kind of having to build the same software. And it was very typically I wrote this bes uh, some DevOps engineer wrote a bespoke way to deploy environments themselves for the various stakeholders at the company, production, staging, maybe some other stuff there. That person has gone or that person has moved on or that person is sick and oh my God, my hair's on fire. Peter, Benji, come save us. And then I would get there and be like, oh my God, this is all done completely wrong. I have to redo the whole thing because this is my bespoke version of this, but I know what I'm talking about versus this other person. And there was actually an instance where we did that move and then we moved on from that company and that same company brought us back because they hired someone that tore out our stuff and we put it back in. So I'm, so like the DevOps space and the SRE space were very opinionated and it's, but it's, it, the problem is, is that there's just way too many options. And so there's a lot of ways to do things. So what I'm getting at here is that we were going to be this high price Kubernetes consulting shop forever. We kind of built our internal tool with Shipyard. The first iteration of it was like an kind of an exoskeleton for us to rapidly support people. Some of our customers ended up seeing, literally seeing these not very good looking interfaces. And they're like, hey, can we click that button? We're like, yeah, sure. So then we started doing that. Then all of a sudden we kind of had this like quasi product that was very, very glue and tapey for our existing customers, but it was pretty cool. And then, you know, hell has to freeze over for me to take another VC dollar. And then in March of 2022, <laughs> I think we all remember that. Got some preemptive term sheets, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, we're a funded company, but that's turned into a great decision. And we've been able to, to, to build a really cool product that we're super proud of. So that's how we got to Shipyard to answer your awesome. question. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Great story. Great story. All right. Well, that, that's actually a good setup segue for, I think, what I, I'd like to dig in on. So people... I guess, you know, I can't speak for everyone because I predate people learning to program by doing JavaScript as like even really an option or even before really doing Python. So for me, I resonate with, you know, oh, a bare metal build system, right? I'm, I have GCC and I can compile my C program and, you know, I have my computer. But one of the things that I think even before, before scaling up a team that you run into is 
oh, JSON compiles and I compile, and we have two different versions of GCC, two different compilers, and all of a sudden, like, our binaries don't behave the same way, right? We don't have, I guess the term is it's like a hermetic build system, right? Like, all of our things aren't self-contained in such a way that, like, maybe his libraries are different than my libraries, right? And with C, maybe this is a little less of an issue. You don't tend to have tons and tons of dependencies. But, okay, so I kind of started it bare metal, you have like your computer running your operating system and your compiler compiling your source code. Kind of take us from there from like what your observation is. And it doesn't have to be on that. Maybe if it's for JavaScript, I, I think there's some analogies there as well. But like, how do people sort of move up the pyramid or move up the stack of saying like, hey, this is like a single user focused thing to the rest of the life cycle after that? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a. It's a big question, but I'll do my oh, best fair to enough. answer. We can it. take it in parts. Yeah, no, no. Well, uh, we're talking about my school days. You're you're doing C plus plus and C, so I'm feeling a little insecure. So I want to like remember okay. something from my compiler's class to sound smart, but I don't know if that's going to happen. So okay, so at the core, you have a gate. No, I'm just kidding. Only <laughs> NAND gates. That's okay, what I mean. Okay, so let me just talk to you in adders. All right, I'll stop. So. So yeah, so I mean, the one big, a big difference here is that between uh, compiled language and a lot of the stuff that's happening in the world that we're in, and, and sorry, so Shipyard, the world that we're in, is we are helping applications, so typically SaaS applications, so okay, great. You know, All right. these are, these are web-based, typically sometimes mobile um, applications, database, application logic, maybe an inference engine. So this is not for compiled programs. Really, actually, Shipyard is not at all, but it's a good analogy. So it's more for interpreted stuff there with Python, JavaScript, that type of thing that you're talking about. But in general, I think the connection between compiling to an application delivery is pretty straightforward. And and what the common practice is today, I could talk about the old practice, but the common practice is use something called containers uh, and typically something called Docker. I, I believe I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Yeah, these are words that I've heard before. These are words that you've heard before. So what a container is, is it's, sorry, what a Docker, I'll just start with a Docker file. What a Docker file is, is it's literally a list of commands with some smart caching in there. So it's like use Ubuntu 20, not npm install, what is apt get, whatever. So you literally write this out in your Docker file so that you have those libraries because dependency stuff is, <laughs> I think, sure. I think naming and dependency problems <laughs> and cache and validation are the three unified things. Oh man, right, there you problem. go. Yeah, that's like the, the three. So, so you basically get your dependencies, you're in this file, and then there's some really smart caching stuff so that it can be faster to, to bring your image, which is, is where your container lives. Okay, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining what a container is, but it's basically a way to encompass your operating system and, and all the necessary libraries that that needs to run a given program. And so let's just take the example of Python. You might need certain pack, pip packages for whatever reason. So I would have a Docker file that's a contain, containment of that. And then I can mount in my code, my Python code, right into the, so that's kind of the way that you encapsulate various things. Now you might have that, you might have a Python application, you might have a, a node application, you might have a Rust application, you might have a Go app, you maybe even have a C++ application. They all can be contained in their own containers. That's probably a good way to do it. And then you need something to orchestrate turning those on and off. And so what that means is that you have things like Kubernetes, which are a scheduler or orchestrator, and those things can turn on and off the various containers that I just described to you to help orchestrate their ability to use each other. So just say I, I had a Python application, I have a container for that, but it needs a database. I have a second container that's my Postgres data container. And then the orchestration piece, okay, you guys can see my hands, they can't, but it makes <laughs> sense if you see it's my true. hands. The orchestration piece says, hey, make sure that database is up before that application is Python thing is up because they can't talk to each other. Is that a decent high level overview? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. So for people who, and, and we've covered some of the stuff with containers before on the show, but just, just as a reminder, not forcing people to do the entire backlog. So the difference between, I think most people kind of know what a virtual machine is. And a virtual machine is running a version of all of the things on your computer on your computer. So its own hard drive, its own memory, its own CPU. We won't get into some of the, the nuances between emulation or not, but, but basically running an instance of everything and wrapping it all up. And then you could run multiple VMs and they can switch between each other. You could save the state. 
So unlike your normal computer, it's completely software controlled. Going from a virtual machine to a container, what what kind of advantages are you on? Like, like why has that been the migration for people to move from one to the other? Sure. Sorry, that's a great question. So with a virtual machine, you have a full snapshot of the operating system and the application code, right? With containers, and the way that you do that is using the hypervisor. So it's actually at the hardware level. So there is some major security benefits to having a hardware layer for security. But it's never perfect. Heartbleed, for example, so nothing's perfect. But <laughs> with containers, what you're doing, and this is probably a really good thing to explain, sorry about that, is that you have the operating system as a shared resource. So it's actually living in a virtual machine at the bottom. Like if you use, if you turn on Docker desktop, there's actually a vir virtual machine at the very bottom that is the shared resource. And so then your containers are very lightweight, sit on top and just have the layers on top of that operating system that might not exist. So Redis might need a cryptography package and Python needs a authentication package. I don't know, but they're both using the same underlying OS in the container. So there's security disadvantages to containers to be clear, but there is a shared resource thing. So what you get out of that is much lighter weight. So like if I want to stop my VM and send it to you, like, that could be, depending on what it is, a four gigabyte file, right? Like the image. Whereas with a container, it's literally just the application definition. So I send that over to you. It's just a little file. And then you might have to pull some other layers or build some other layers that you might not have. But you're not building Ubuntu and you're using it as a shared resource. So they're a lot, they're a lot more portable and you have these shared resources underneath. So it's a lot more efficient. So you can have so instead of having to carve out an entire operating system for each one of those services I described before, there's a shared one at the bottom, almost always. And then there's just the packages on top that are, they are gated from each other, but there's security issues there. So Sure. So then, so, okay, so it's composable and we can compose a Python package and a Redis and then the Python can talk to the Redis so we can serve, serve our website and have our, you know, data store that we can, we can write to. So sure. then, then you talk about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes isn't for orchestrating the composing of the containers into one. I, I don't know what the term, what is the term for like, you have the collection of things and you want to orchestrate them with Kubernetes. I don't know. I, I don't have the right term for that the lingo. So, I mean, it's you basically it's a Kubernetes cluster that contains okay. a bunch of pods. Pods are basically containers. And then those containers are typically, or sorry, pods are typically in what is known as a namespace. So your cluster can have n number of namespaces, but there's some there's some like you you put all your pods in a container, they can talk to each other automatically and if you want to break out of that namespace, that's a whole other whole other permission thing. A large part of the Kubernetes and CNCF ecosystem is all about security controls and what's okay. known as RBAC or role-based authentic I don't know what the AC stands for. <laughs> RBAC. I know what it does. I, don't, I, ooh, I should know that. Role-based access control. Thank you. Role-based. I knew that was a test. You passed the test. Good job. Okay. So, all right. So we're orchestrating all of this. And this seems like I probably, as the developer in the role I am today, I probably care about this awfully late. I'm probably really far along in having my application up and working, just personally, because this isn't sure. something that I've done before. So I imagine you kind of explain the narrative of how you got to where you are. This isn't uncommon that people sort of build up their stuff. They start running multiple instances, maybe with some sort of load balancer. Oh, see, I know something. Load balancer up in the front, distributing, tra and then realizing, oh, hang on, this is actually a nightmare to sort of keep up and running. And then you sort of start bringing in tools like Docker and Kubernetes, but add a whole new layer of security and sophistication when I look at those tools, I don't really understand you know, necessarily what they do because they're solving a problem that isn't a problem I relate to yet. And I think that's likely where you were sort of getting at where companies get themselves into a bit of a mess and then call you in and say, hey, we need help with the mess. Yeah, that's right. So I think a modern approach probably in the last five to six years, and this is, this is I would say, completely thanks to Docker and that ecosystem, is that these days, if you're writing a web application of any size, you, you almost always try and start off with a container. That's not true for all enterprise, and, and there are exceptions to this, and especially if you're doing like real low-level stuff, like I don't think it would make sense. But you typically want to get 
as close to production locally as a developer as possible. That's always kind of the overarching goal. It was not an accessible goal up until kind of this Docker thing, and it's still a little flawed. But yeah, you might want to just install uh, these packages locally on your on your desktop. And then when it's time to, to share the application or collaborate on the application or host the application, then it's just like, where do I go? So the typical mm-hmm. pattern that we're starting to see today that I've said over, I would say over the last three years is, is pretty, pretty typical is you have a situation where you develop something locally, you try and containerize it to some degree. As a, so There's a lot of developer pluses out there, if you will, that kind of do it themselves and kind of get that little bit of orchestration going locally. But then how do you get that into production and then all the intermediary environments in between, that's kind of where Shipyard comes in for all of this stuff. Okay, awesome. So, so this word environments in between, and I guess we, we might have cue that in by the, the name of the episode. But all right, what, what here, this word environment, what is that? What do you mean by that? Sure. So when I'm working on an application locally, that's my local development environment, right? It means that like I can make it work locally. I have, I turn on Postgres, I turn on Python, whatever. Then there are other environments in the typical software development lifecycle of most companies, especially on the application side. And They are typically high level development. So this is a shared place where all the code is living for all the developers to go look like in the web, in the cloud somewhere. Then there are typically some versions of testing environments and then staging environments and then production. And that's just like a high level version of this. And so the idea is, is that as you're, as you're working on a feature, you, you start locally, once you feel good about it, you put that in a shared space, maybe get some feedback from another developer, maybe do a code review. Once you're happy with, with the code that you've written, then you would merge it into the main branch. And then once that happens, then it gets hopefully into some type of staging where other stakeholders look at it typically, sort of, they're supposed to, and you run some tests. And then once you're happy with that, you release it out to the world through some system. Now, all of the thing I just described to you is what's known as, and I know you guys know this, um, is, is CI. So, you know, continuous integration. And there's a lot of tools for that that are basically the shepherds of all this stuff. Personally, we use Circle CI and GitHub Actions, but I've used Jenkins and, and Travis and Argo and Flux over the years. There's a lot of good options here. BuildKite's another great one that I'm, I like those guys a lot. So yeah, so that's kind of what these environments mean. One thing that might be obvious here is how do you know when to merge and deploy a new environment is a big challenge for internal DevOps and also development teams. And then the other thing there is, should that be manual? Should that be automatic? And so there's a whole, and, and the whole point of continuous means that it's supposed to be automatic, but that is a very hard thing to achieve internally at software teams typically. So I understand in, in the production environment, you have users stimulating your application, doing things, hopefully, hopefully you have customers and they're, they're using it for things. In this sort of staging, I guess this is where a tradition I would sort of, you have either QA scripts or people going and simulating, you know, interaction with the application. And then in sort of development, is it, it's the developers who are going in and sort of like pushing buttons and clicking things and getting databases set up. Is that, is that roughly like yeah. how the, each of the, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, and it's, it's bespoke for every organization and that's part of the problem. It's like, there is no one way to do this. There's a lot of different versions. Like I would, I would almost go as far to say that literally every single software application has its own unique version of every single thing we just described, except for those using shipyard, then there is some commonality. Um, but, but literally every single application has its own little nooks and crannies and little knobs that you need to tweak to actually make it work. And that's all, that's typically contained within the DevOps person's brain or who's ever responsible for that. And they already have so much stuff to do. That's kind of where the the problems begin from an efficiency perspective and velocity perspective. That makes sense. So I have some feature up and it needs like some state in order to be able to, to be tested. I mean, is this, is this kind of like where we end up needing something a little bit more sophisticated is like, Hey, I want something to be in a given place to demonstrate to someone else at works or to debug an issue from what we've talked about so far. That seems like a lot of effort for me to go 
curate a specific something into the state ready for demonstrating my stuff or having it work. You know, I'm adding something to the end of the checkout process. So you need someone to go pick something off of a page, add it to the cart, enter their information, but, and then you can show me that's a lot of work for someone else to do to approve a PR or whatever. Is this the kind of stuff where you begin to start to run into issues with sort of like how everyone sort of shares these things around or, or where do where do people start running into the downsides of just kind of one-off doing all of this? So, I mean, there's the place to start here is with the software development lifecycle in general, right? So typically a product person works with a designer or UX person and says, hey, I want feature X. I want this blue button to do this when you click it in the existing application. Eventually the design for that gets over to a developer and it's kind of thrown over a wall. The developer creates the feature and then at some point that product person gets to see that feature. So that's the first problem. The problem is, is that a developer could work on a feature and two weeks later, they're getting feedback. Hey, that's the wrong color blue. Mm. Or when you click this, it's supposed to do that, not this. So then there's this huge developer um, context switching costs because as a developer myself, and I'm, I'm sure you can speak to this, like when it's in my brain, my mental model is all filled out. No problem. The second it's out, like, it's like, oh God, I don't even know why I named it. Like, I don't even know what I was doing. Don't worry for any shipyard customers. I am not programming anymore. With, so that's so rest <laughs> assured. This is not a problem. For shipyard. I am no longer, I have been, I have, I haven't had a commit to the. You had it taken system. away from you, huh? I, I literally have not had a commit to the code base in six months to protect our customer. But that's not entirely true, but somewhat true. But that feedback loop being very long is, is really taxing and it's it's a stop and start type situation for the developer. Sure. It's also super frustrating for product people. Now take that a, one step further. So you have a product person that says, okay, this is the right color blue, but then there's a QA engineer or automated QA test or auto manual QA tester that another two days later is like, oh, hey, like this broke this other thing that you didn't realize. And you're like, ah, well, I just fixed this other thing and then I moved back to my other feature. So the whole point of shipyard uh, and ephemeral environments in general, it's really a methodology where as soon as it's off of my fingertips and I'm ready to commit this and share this with a developer or anybody like that, it should be asynchronously available for all these other key stakeholders to look at and give feedback so that everything just gets tighter. It's a much tighter feedback loop. And then also product people aren't frustrated. QA people aren't doing the hurry up and wait which is very typically their lives. And so it just all becomes kind of synchronous. Now, the other big pain point there is that if you wanted to do this without ephemeral environments or at least good stage, well, really ephemeral environments, you could, people do that, but that looks like, okay, product person, I've got a 45 minute screen share with you because we're now in a remote world anyway. Um, So I've got a 45 minute screen share with you. You're going to give me feedback, but you're not even really able to click on it. Typically, Mm -hmm. you can tell me what you want me to click on. And then, okay, well, maybe I'm more creative than that. So I'm going to use something like ngrok, which is great. I love ngrok. But even if I'm using ngrok, which is a reverse proxy that can get you, so I can, if for those that don't know, ngrok is a great tool. You can turn it on locally and it kind of tunnels out to the world. Um, great, here, product person, use this ngrok link. But guess what? You're still running off of my local copy of it. Oh, actually, means, I didn't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can't do development because you need to test this thing. So I'm yep. going to break what you're doing. So the solution here is giving everybody their own environment for every feature, multiple stakeholders for the same feature. So your next point, getting state right, is the next huge challenge. And the idea here is that you need a database with information in it or the application is not going to work to your exact point. So replicating that data across all these these different environments and also it being sane. Like you can't just use stuff from six months ago. You got to keep it up to date, sync it across. And then also giving, well, so now Shipyard comes in and this is a feature that we're very proud of and people love. There's like a data dashboard where you can actually cherry pick, hey, I want the state when I was working on this feature from two weeks ago, I want to use that for this new PR that I'm doing and vice versa. So again, without seeing my hands moving around, I think it doesn't <laughs> sound as smart, but it's really cool. So so you kind of like allow people to define, oh, we'll just make up another term, whatever. You like allow people to find up like a bundle of data and say, give it a name and be able to use that in multiple places. Yeah, that's that's basically correct. Huh. 
And then the, so more than, the, okay, I kind of see now. So the Docker file and everything is a piece of the puzzle. We have to describe how the thing builds, but it's only one piece. Exactly. There's all these other bits and pieces that need to get brought in. And even teaching Docker itself how to go to, and I don't even know how that works. I mean, I guess that's your magic. It was like, hey, I have a PR I'm working on, but it needs to know, hey, I need to go pull that specific version of the code, not just the code checked in or the tag or the latest. It's like it needs to go to a very specific variant of maybe multiple code exactly. bases and pull yep. them all in, pull some data down, get it all up and running so that many different people could come and like try something out. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And uh, yeah, we do have support for multi-repo, which is another feature that we love, not to plug Shipyard too much. But yeah, there is two big things here to talk about just for your users is there's there's mono repo, which have all your code for everything in one big repo, or what we're seeing a lot these days is multi-repo, and people call that, I think they call that polyrepo, also is another term people use, where you might have your front-end code for, with React in one repository, your back-end code in, in Node in a different repository, and then another service in Rust or whatever. Coordinating all those to be on the right SHAs and the right hashes and getting the right all those things is very challenging. It's doable. So let me be clear, like this is a this is something that people have been doing within Google for I don't know, 15 years, more than that, um, and, and large engineering orgs, but they have dedicated, you know, 100, 200 person DevOps teams that focus on that. So really what, what's happened here is that because of technologies, we're on the backs of giants, on, because of technologies like Docker, because of stuff like Kubernetes, which is all under the hood for everything Shipyard does, to be clear. Now this elastic compute that you get by it being really fast to turn on and off and it being smart, you can now do these types of environments very quickly and turn them on, turn them off, because that's the other part we didn't even talk about, cost controls. Like you don't want to have these environments running when no one's using them because it's expensive and wasteful. So yeah, so what Shipyard is doing is kind of helping give DevOps people, um, they can focus on being an SRE for production, not for internal tooling, because this is becoming, this is pretty much expected tooling for any decent size software SaaS company, like say you're over 15 engineers, like you need to have multiple environments. Honestly, once you're over four or five engineers and you can't just like do a quick screen share, that's when you start running into like really bad releases. Yeah. And one other thing, maybe not the best time to bring it up, but I'll tell you it anyways, is there's this concept of testing within our SaaS world. I'm sure you guys are more than aware and there's, there's unit testing. And then there's also what's known as functional testing or more specifically end to end testing. Oh, I'm sorry, integration testing is what I meant to say. But end-to-end -end testing, where it's literally there's frameworks like Cypress or Playwright or Selenium, where they like have a fake browser that just <laughs> clicks on buttons for you, and you can script it. So it literally brings up a browser, and it's like a, a human. And that's what the, I think, Jason, you were talking about that earlier, like the scripted QA stuff. So you have the scripted QA stuff. So if you have ephemeral environments, you can run those tests before a human, like I make my PR, Shipyard create, and this is what we're seeing, and this is what we're doing ourselves, and a bunch of customers are doing. There's case studies you can find on our website. But you bring up a PR, that PR is automatically has end to end tests run against it. So before I even bring in my product person or my code, my other developer for code review or my QA person for manual QA, I already have a clean bill of health saying, like, I'm not wasting any human's time because I already know that all the things I expect to work still work. And if they don't, great, the developer gets feedback right away. They either update the test or they update and they fix it. And the only way to do real end-to-end -end testing is with production-like environments, so full-stack environments. And that is a difficult thing to do, so you have to bespoke build that in your CI platform um, or use Shipyard. So there's a lot of moving pieces to get. I'm beginning to see the, the picture of of where the intricacies lay and why you might think at first like, oh, it's just one more little script or one more little thing. But then like you're pointing out, I, I mean, we've had this before. Someone's like, oh, hey, I have a Jenkins machine and there's like all these builds didn't get cleaned up because something hung or whatever. And so they're just left suspended eating up, eating up space. Let me just go write one more script to like, Anything exceeding, you know, 14 <laughs> days. And then someone has a job that they expect to take. You know, it's just, a, yeah, it's a never ending, ending battle. It's like, it's like you like, like the, the carnival thing where the gophers pop out of the holes. That's a oh, whack-a-mole. Kind of, yeah. hack that is, that is a very good description of a DevOps person's life. And I am a DevOps person, so I can say that. 
Or so, okay, was, actually, this, this, this may be a, a good, a, uh, a, a bit late to, to have that conversation, but I, mean, I think it's a bit interesting as well. This is a term that I've seen pop up a lot more recently than <clears throat> maybe when I first got started. But this, this like role of saying DevOps, or, or I think we alluded to before SRE, like a site reliability engineer. Is that SRE? Okay, good. I got it. Something like that. But, like these are terms that for like when I was starting, they weren't an option. They weren't, you know, what people would do. We knew of like sysadmins, people who would like, you know, come to your computer and help you get your stuff, make sure everybody's developers had all the software they need and, you know, that that kind of stuff. But what in your mind, like what is a DevOps engineer and what does that role really like mean and what does it entail? Yeah, I mean, so it's changing right now as we speak. I would say that the sysadmin that you're speaking of was, you know, back in the day, they were responsible for that sunbox with the 128 processors that you only had two turned on for or whatever to make sure that pets.com would stay up. And quickly people kind of realized, okay, sysadmins, like they're good at what they do, but like understanding real-time systems and like what's like CH mod is not the only thing that you need to do. So there's other skill sets that they're developing, but really this is a different, like you don't want someone that understands all of these like intricacies of keeping a production system up also dealing with like, hey, I forgot to reset my password type thing. So a role was kind of created, the DevOps role. I mean, I don't know the numbers on this, but I would guess like 10 or 15 years ago is when it probably came to some level of prominence. And that is like a sysadmin slash developer because you also need to have a bit of understanding of application code because you need to be able to be like, well, this is failing here. I'm looking at the log. I have to jump into the code base and see if there's something obvious here. And it, so it's kind of just like a developer operations sysadmin type role that's what a devops person was is and so they're kind of responsible for everything or ideally they're responsible for all your infrastructure to make sure that all works which does include hey i'm a new developer joining company x i want to make sure like how do i start developing that day that kind of became a little too encompassing because if i'm worrying about new developers turning on like being able to develop then I'm not worrying about production being efficient or going down or not going down. And basic, I don't know when this happened, but Google released the SRE handbook, I want to say I don't know, eight years ago, maybe it was more than that. And they, they coined the term SRE, that's Site Reliability Engineer. And those folks are responsible for making sure that the site itself, if you will, so production, is reliable. The way they do that is with service level or SLOs and SLAs and SLIs, which are little measurements of saying like, I have a service level uh, objective of having the database not be down more than five nines or whatever. And so my job is to keep it that way. The SRE is a DevOps person that's focused on production is kind of how I think of it. But that never holds true because SRE then ends up being like, well, I know how to fix production, so I probably know how to fix your local development environment. And I might <laughs> know how to fix, I definitely know how to fix staging, but it's going to take me a second. And like, remember what these people are doing, it's always, it's never a quick thing, right? It's never like, oh, I have to change this one line of code and everything's fine. It's I have to change this one line of code and then all this stuff has to trigger, rebuild, oh, you know what, this data is corrupted. I'm going to have to move over a 400 gigabyte Postgres volume mount over there. That doesn't take two minutes. That takes a while, and depending on your IOPS, I guess. But it could take a while. And guess what? As a DevOps person or SRE, like I got to make sure that doesn't get corrupted in the R sync. So the point is, is that the DevOps life is a one of patience and a lot of, of focus and SRE life. So... What I think is happening, what I see happening is you have SREs becoming real, just SRE, SREs, just focus on production, which is definitely the model that Google kind of prescribed to us. And it's a really good, you should check out the SRE handbook. I don't, you can Google that one pretty easily, obviously. And then, and then the DevOps person is kind of like, how do I turn on Postgres correctly without causing a problem? How do I orchestrate the application so that it works well? And ultimately, there is a huge lack of DevOps people in this world right now and there's a huge need for them and so that's kind of that's kind of where shipyard came from yeah so shipyard's role help me here is like to empower devops people or replace devops people well i i think empower devops people to be sres for production 
Like that's kind okay. of the way that I look at it. The truth though, is that what we've built is what I have wanted to build every single time I've ever joined a company. So there can be a little friction. I'm not going to lie. I get it. I have empathy for that. But ultimately what we've seen is that everyone, all the DevOps people we work with, once we've convinced them that our stuff works the way we say it's going to work and that the application definition is as simple as we say it's going to be, right now that's Docker Compose. Just We can talk about that later. But once we build trust, they love us. But they're definitely skeptical at the beginning and it is a tool that everyone kind of wants to build. Like that is like the, the whole point is like, hey, I make a change and automatically everything goes up and it's awesome and anyone can use it. And then when they're done using it, it automatically goes down. So it really is kind of, you know, it is the cool, like it's what we all want to build. So there's a little friction there, but I, but ultimately it works out. I'm going to jump in here and interrupt our interview today to talk about our sponsor, Zencaster. Zencaster is an all-in-one podcast production suite that gives you studio quality audio and video without needing all that technical know-how. It records each guest locally, then uploads the crystal clear audio and video right into the suite so you have high quality raw materials to work with. Jason and I have been using Zencaster for programming Throwdown for a while now, and it's a huge upgrade over the way we used to do things. It's so much easier and more seamless to have everybody join a Zencaster room and get individual audio streams for each participant, which allows editing and mastering to go much more quickly. It just also feels like a better experience for all involved. I'm so happy that we uh, have this new solution instead of the way we used to do things back when we first started. If you would like to try Zencaster to make your own podcast, you can get a free trial by going to zen.ai slash programming throwdown. That's zen.ai slash programming throwdown. Back to the podcast. And then, so, and then we can leave, leave this topic, but so DevOps people, how, how do people kind of get into that? I mean, you were saying that you kind of self-titled your, your, that's your current role is like more like DevOps focus, this kind of thing. Like you talked about being a background, you know, computer science, use your event, like this stuff. Now you do DevOps. Is that a typical path you see people take? Do people come the other way? They start more like operating system, sysadmin, and then they add in some developers, a mix of both. Like you said, it's a under, I, I think I've heard that before. Like it's a under service role currently. Like it's a lot, it's really hard to find these people that have the right mix of knowledge. What is your take there? If someone says that sounds really interesting. What's the, what's the right thing to go sort of Google, look at, think about, go to school for? Yeah, I'm very torn on this one because underneath it all, I feel like being a sysadmin is the key. But also without that developer knowledge, it's not as powerful. So I think that what I would always say is just find a repository. I'll, I'll, I'll shipyard, if you go to github.com slash shipyard, we have got a bunch of starter <laughs> applications that are like Flask, Postgres, whatever, but there's plenty of other options out there. And just get it working. If you really want to be serious about your career in DevOps land, I think having a basis of understanding Linux is probably the more challenging thing to pick up. So you probably want to maybe start your focus there. But also, it's really about curiosity. It's like, it's like if you're good at dealing with problems and you want to deal with problems, DevOps is a great role to be in because you just run into the weirdest operating system level problems you run out of pages kernel pointer you don't even know what stuff your problems you're having i think to be a good devops engineer you have to be a, a decent developer and a good system admin guy that's or admin person is what i would say no, that's a great observation i we were just trying to tell to, to people this like it's kind of interesting even the amount of operating system knowledge you're supposed to learn as a developer is sort of, I don't know, not counterintuitive, but not obvious in the start. Like, oh, everyone should learn programming. You sit down and write a Python and, okay, do you know about apt-get? Do you, can you apt-get install pip? Like, wait, what now? I'm on Windows. Where do I go? Right. And it's like, oh, wait, hang on. You know, and, and we've gotten better at some of that stuff, I think, collectively. But I think uh, it's interesting that even now I would – consider like like i use unix environments or linux environments routinely but i would not by any means dare to breathe the word like proficient or expert as as like my ability despite having been you know 
decades in the as a programmer. That's that's because you have experience. So people who put expert are are the people who just ha- haven't learned <laughs> how how little of an expert we actually are at everything. <laughs> Yeah, I, I cannot agree with that more. The, the longer I get into my career, the more I realize I don't know. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a well, good cool. Well, I mean, I think we're gonna gonna sort of like call that a pretty good coverage of the of the topic at hand. So let's talk about Shipyard as a company. Can you tell us a little bit about like Shipyard as a company? I know you talked about some recent changes and some things like. Are you guys growing? Are you hiring internship? What's it like to work there? Sure. Are you remote? Are you in office? I mean, that was a big topic, but just sort of give us the give us the pitch. Yeah. So okay. So the pitch is shipyard get an ephemeral environment on every pull request or code change. So that's the that's the thing. But yeah. So we're a funded company, VC back company. We've actually got some great investors. We're about ten people. We are growing. We are hiring. Please check out our careers page for that. We are actively hiring. We are on Twitter at Shipyard Build. We also have a community site, actually, this is a good one, called ephemeralenvironments.io. I hope you put that in. It's ephemeral is I learned how to spell it, but it took me like 10 years. Ephemeral It'll be in the show notes. People will just okay, be able to click on it. Great. And that's so what that is, is that is a community site. PR is welcome. And the whole idea here is that as I mentioned, like ephemeral environments is not a new paradigm. It's just becoming an accessible one. And we're a part of that, but there are other people and other uh, companies trying to to work on this and just other open source projects out there. So these are kind of best practices of how to become ephemeral, how to use it, what what to do. So you should check ephemeralenvironments.io. Our website is shipyard.build. Yeah, and so we're doing well. Had some really early success with some awesome design partners that we're really thankful for. And yeah, and we have a free trial now, actually, soon to probably be a free tier, but I'm not going to say officially, but we're working on that. Remember every one of the environments, I'm sorry, every one of the organizations we have, or maybe I didn't tell you this, gets its own cluster. We are very, very security focused. We have a bunch of regulations that we have to make sure we're on top of SOC 2, um, HIPAA, all these other, ITAR, etc. So we're really good about, we, we try to be really good about security, but you can never be perfect, obviously. Yeah. Any other questions about Shipyard? Did I cover everything? No, I mean, I think, what what would you say if someone was saying, you know, maybe I apply to Shipyard, like, what is the thing that you would say you would look for them to be interested in? Like, what would they be passionate about that would make them a great, a great fit? Yeah, I mean... High level efficiency is something that's important to them. Like understanding how broken uh, our software development life, or maybe broken is not the right word, but slow and arduous. People that want to automate, people that want to help people move faster or companies move faster, which is a very cliche thing to say, but it's true. And then the other thing is, is like, look, we are in a critical path for all of our customers. They depend on us every day. So understanding that we're actually, you're going to have a lot of responsibility. You have to have a passion around DevOps to some degree, or at least making good software and and enabling product people and QA people to do that. That's kind of what we're looking for. But ultimately, you know, people that are curious and just want to make things is really what it comes down to because every day, you know, we're spending time on on calls and planning and, and all these things. And the whole point is, is that our entire product is built off of customer feedback of being like, oh, hey, like, this is great, but like, can I look at my logs in Datadog? You're like, yeah, sure. So we build out this Datadog thing, and then all of a sudden, all of our customers want our Datadog integration. You know, just the whole point here is that we have some really cool, we're at the precipice of of software development getting a lot faster, and we're just trying to help push it along. And so people that are a little empathetic to the pains of, of other software development teams is another big thing we look for. And remember, or maybe don't remember, I'm telling you, we dog food <laughs> shipyard with shipyard. So we build shipyard with shipyard. We I was going to ask that actually. Yeah. <laughs> so we are, we are definitely one of the larger users of shipyard. We're not actually the largest user anymore. We haven't been for six months or so, but for a long time, we were the largest user of shipyard from a builds perspective and the commit perspective and a business perspective. And so when we screw something up, yeah, <laughs> we're going to know before everybody else. So we work hard to not do that, but also, you know, being able to react quickly and uh, cool under pressure is another big trait that we like to have. I, I had a question, a bit of a non sequitur, but when you talked about being the biggest 
<clears throat> the biggest consumer of shipyard, it kind of made spark this this question, which is, you know, how do you who is who do you go to when you want to you know acquire a customer? Because I feel like this is something I've often wondered, never really asked anybody. Is you know clearly you're interested in in developers, but something like shipyard, it's not like a, an IDE like Sublime where you can go straight to developers and say, hey, give me fifteen bucks. And so you know you're kind of you kind of want to target the sort of the the sort of let's say vp of engineering or cto or something but then that person is so high level that it might be hard for them to grok what's going on and so i feel like a lot of companies that are sort of uh you know like they have an enterprise tier you know, how do they who, who do you go for like who's your ideal person on linkedin when you want to try and acquire a new business yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the term that we use in startup land, because I'm learning all this, I, I yeah, I'm yeah, I'm now the CEO, is ICP or initial customer profile is is the term that we're supposed to use. And Ooh, nice. That's yeah, and that's something that that we're constantly iterating on and developing. Um, so the way that Shipyard has kind of put our, our company together is we had this very early, we had some early customers for the consulting side of the thing. And then we raised some money and we've been super heads down building out a, a fully fledged platform. So there was a lot of work that we didn't even realize. Stability is the most important thing. Features is then very important as well. So we've been super heads down. We, we got a bunch of great design partners and that's we use, you know, what's known as founder-led sales for the most part. There, there has been some other different top of funnel stuff there. And then we signed all our design partners. And now we're figuring out the go-to-market and the ICP. But I think you hit the nail on the head where it is the VPs of engineering or the directors of, of, of engineering and whatnot. And the trick there is that the other departments that we talked about are kind of getting frustrated because they're not seeing features early enough and they're, and it has to, you have to find the people that it, it's trickling back up to, but that are also the decision makers. I will say that most VPs of engineering and directors of engineering and even CTOs for that matter, have a pretty good understanding of environments and, and it's just a matter of explaining, oftentimes replacing half-baked solutions, frankly, or underbaked solutions, maybe is a better way to put that. But yeah, so finding those people and that's what we're working on so you know it's one of the reasons why i'm on your podcast you know customers welcome but uh yeah totally yeah yeah we're working on that and that's the stage of the company that we're at we're, we're figuring out our go-to-market as we speak we've had some early success and now it's just a matter of figuring out where to keep personally i don't think linkedin is a good place because as a devops person or a vp of engineering i never read my linkedin messages i think <laughs> yeah. probably have to change that yeah. at some well the, point. the free tier is interesting because you have potential for uh, some bottom exactly. i think that's what it's called right bottom up marketing basically that's, you that's put out exactly the free right. tier you get a coalition of developers to use it and then and then now you have this oh, what's the term for this anyways but you have you have a coalition of people at the company who are all you know in alignment there and then they can motivate leadership Right. It's it's called an internal champion. It sounds ah, like okay, there it on is. all these calls I've had with all these VCs. It's awesome. No, no, we're we're actually a, a member of a of a and if anyone's doing especially developer focused software platform, you should check them out and maybe I don't know. But there's a there's a VC fund slash incubator thing called Heavy Bit. And some of the best dev tool companies have gone through there and we're very fortunate to be in there. And they very much What is it Dame one more time? I'm sorry, Heavy Bit. Heavy bit. Okay. Just yeah. for the, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Sure. Well, okay. Then you have to put all my investors in there. They'll get mad at me, but whatever. <laughs> okay. You just email us. We'll um, put it on there. No, don't do that. This is not an advertisement for investors, but I will say that heavy bit has been instrumental in, and if you can find it, don't put it in the show notes, but if you can find heavybit.com, but they've been instrumental in kind of helping guide us through this whole bottoms up adoption thing where you reach out and you have a product that developers can use. And that that's who shipyard is for. It's for developers that, that, don't want to focus all their time and DevOps people that don't want to focus all their time on these internal environments, but they still need them. And so you, you start from the ground up, you get these people bought, bought in, and then, you know, they're the ones that bring it internally into their companies to, for the long tail thing. Cool. Thanks for explaining that. I was always curious and yeah, I think you covered it really well. Great. Anything else I could give you my sort of answers to? <laughs> we, we can do all manner of opinions on uh, world events, tech top. No, no, no. I think I think this is a this has been a great episode. I think this is important 
important topic. I, I've learned stuff. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful you came on. And I mean, it's, it's great to see people out there building products to help help developers and development just like go better and, and faster. And so, you know, excited to, to have you continue to do that so that all the products we use are just going to be magically better. I mean, it's not magic, but it's it, it's true. We've seen we've seen some really cool numbers lately, where we have one team in particular. I was on a call with them the other day, and they are doing fifty percent more tickets since they started using Shipyard over the last like six months. It's unfair to say that's all Shipyard because I don't know, but I do know that that feedback loop is getting shorter, tickets are getting done faster. So fifty percent velocity increase. That's pretty cool. If we can get we're still figuring out where where that is. Other feedback we've had a lot is on the whole testing thing where the customer success team likes using Shipyard. They don't use Shipyard, but they love people using it because a lot fewer bugs are getting through because one of the problems with testing is that you get so many false positive tests that you just end up ignoring your tests. And everyone does it. Everyone does it. They might lie and pretend like they don't, but everyone does it. But if you can test earlier and transfer the ownership of that failing test earlier on in the cycle, then all of a sudden those tests become much more reliable. And ultimately testing, unit testing, and end testing, it's all about, it's really about confidence. It's not, you're never going to be perfect, but it's like as a developer, am I confident that I can get this out the door and move faster? And the end result is that customer success people are dealing with a lot less tickets. So that's another place that is, you know, a very good thing. And then the last one, just to pitch Shipyard, is cost control because people do have environments, but they just get left on for months at a time. And so we monitor the environments. We keep them on when you're using them. We turn them off when you're not. And remember, this is container, so it's very quick to turn these things back on. You just click a button, and then if you stop using it, it goes down. So cost control, security, all these things, this is what Shipyard is. Oh, one thing I did not plug, I forgot to plug. I am a co-host of a podcast called Cubelist. Sorry if that's, I hope it's okay to... No, go for it. Yeah, Yeah, Um, totally. So yeah, so Cubelist is... Very CNCF Kubernetes focused, but that's kubeless.com and you can check it out. I co-host that with Mark, the CTO from Replicated. There's also a newsletter, but in general, our goal right now is to try and just get as much best practices out there because we've just hurt ourselves and shot ourselves in the foot so much. Bringing it back to the experience thing, you know, I don't know everything, but I know a lot of mistakes I've made over the years, especially in the software development lifecycle. And, and so we're trying to help fix as many of those as possible. Man, your episode list has pictures and everything. Like, I don't know, man. I, I think I take it back. We're going to have to edit that out. Like, you're making us look bad over here. <laughs> oh, oh, man, we I, got scooped. Oh, I'm, I'm just sorry, teasing, I'm just sorry. teasing. <laughs> oh, no, it's no, great. I, I, I don't do it. I don't do it. It's the, the, the repli- Mark and the replicated guys are great. And, and actually, again, for some reason, Heavy Bit is great as well. They help us. We're part of their catalog of podcasts and stuff like that. But, Jason, we need VCs, man. We need VCs. Yeah. It's official. All right, I'll, I'll let me know. I'm happy. <laughs> Wait, but shipyard.build is the point of the whole thing. So everyone, okay. Yeah. That. So it's actually, good. one thing, if you know, we have a lot of folks in college. You know, I looked at at shipyard.build earlier today, and you know, you know, a college kid looks at five hundred dollars a month and says, you know, I just can't do that, right? So, so I know the free tier is coming. So should folks wait for that? Should they send you an email if someone if someone really wants to try shipyard? What's the next step for them? Like so, someone in college. So- So right now we have a free trial and you get the full experience for 30 days. If you're in college and you want to try it out, sign up for that. If you're, if we see you have good usage and you reach out, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that you don't, we'll make sure that we get you early access to the free tier. Let's call it that, but probably a little bit even better than that. We want everyone using this. We want everyone learning. But the thing to keep in mind also is that if you're a college student that's just using it for yourself, I'm happy for you guys to do that. But really, it's for the college students that are working on a project with multiple people yep, that yep. there's a lot of value there. So you, all you need is a GitHub account, which is free, and sign up and, and reach out. And yeah, I think info at shipyard.build is the best way to do that. But there's information in the console. And also, kick the tires. Like You find bugs, you find stuff like that. We're happy to have you in there, and we'll find a way to, to get you to keep let you keep access. Cool. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I really like, you know, if I had to do my PhD over again, I would, uh, well, I would cry and I would, I would uh, lose a lot of sleep and a lot of hair, but 
But once I gotten over the trauma, I would I would use a lot more CI, CD, and like dev tools because I found that near the end of my PhD, you know, I had to get this journal paper done and I needed to gather a lot of results. And 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 especially at the end of your PhD, <clears throat> you're not really trying to invent another new thing. You're trying to write a paper, like survey kind of papers that try your method 2000 different times and, and have a lot of nice graphs and data and all of that. And the bad design decisions that I made, you know, in the first level were really kind of catching up with me. And I think that having a, you know, having a, a tool like Shipyard would have helped, you know, kind of keep some of that technical debt under control. So yeah, if you're doing a, a doctorate or, you know, if you're working in a lab or even like a senior design project, you know, anything that's involved you and, and several other people, I think that it could be great to, you know, get on tools like this. So. Yeah, that's, I mean... I wish there was some CICD stuff back then, but yeah, it, it, it becomes a, yeah, it becomes, it becomes kind of, it's become standard practice to protect you from yourself. Um, and also just, I mean, the whole reason we program is because we had to type the same thing twice and we're like, I can't type the same thing twice. I need to spend two days writing something to do that for me. Stop, stop, stop. No, no. <laughs> My heart's getting torn asunder here. Well, I mean, Hey, we all went to computer science school. Uh, yeah. Wait, I, I have a question for you. What, what was your PhD in? Sorry, I just didn't know. Oh yeah, my PhD was uh, this crazy idea of like trying to play Go with with the neural networks. It'll I, never work. It'll never take off. <laughs> I did. I, I I I my my Excel based neural net was uh, not a PhD. It was a class that I took, but it was to play Go. Oh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, similarly, you know, my my Go rating is something like 27 co or something so so i was like well this can't stand so so i got to create a computer to actually play good go for me and you literally did a phd on it yeah <laughs> pretty much yeah that's cool that's super cool all right well i could talk to you about this stuff a bunch but we should have uh yeah i'm happy to come on your show and talk about computer go definitely yeah that'd be great <laughs> anyway yeah yeah absolute pleasure yeah, well, thanks for coming on, Benji. I appreciate it. This has been a, a great episode. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and sticking with us every episode and engaging with us as we uh, learn and explore. And uh, I should, we should have a tagline. Dang it, that sounded like it was almost cool. <laughs> learn and explore with Jason and Patrick. <laughs> All right, till next time. Thank you, everyone, so much for, for supporting us on Patreon and on, on Audible. We really appreciate your time and you know, look forward to uh, the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Music by Eric Barndaller. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide an attribution to Patrick and I and share alike in kind.